Um, last time I presented here, um, two years ago, I was just beginning analysis, so I presented some preliminary results as far as I remember. Uh, I'm not sure how correct they were, but um, <laughs> it's all done now, so um, yeah, you get the real thing. So the aim of this study was to find um, long-term trends in both the catch composition, um, so relative abundance, and the Kondrickian um, actual abundance. And what I'm going to do today is just um, tell you about the um, lump survey. So it's two, between two discrete periods, between 1898 and 1933, and then again 1985 to, two, uh, to 2010. Um, this is by far the earliest, well not by far, it's um, the earliest scientific data that I could find by a good few years. So South Africa is very, very lucky to have data um, yeah, this old and of this good quality. Just a quick side remark, um, the South African inshore trawl fishery did not develop, um, it didn't follow an organic progression from a subsistence fishery to a large scale um, exploitation fishery. Um, it was opened by scientific surveys funded by the government. Okay. To that in the moment. The outline of the talk, um, geography, that should go quite quickly. I'm actually going to spend most of the time on the history of the fisheries and some of the data and data preparation points. Um, I've skimmed down my results to only the sharks, so I've gotten rid of um, all the fish stuff. Um, and I think I've streamlined it so that what I have to say um, will cover everything. Um, just the conclusions, um, I'll summarize everything up there. Um, and then, yeah, maybe talk a little bit about management. There we are. So this is um, the south coast of South Africa. <coughs> Mossel Bay is here. Cape Agulhas is here. Um, the Agulhas Bank is where um, all the troll fishing takes place. Now the inshore fishery takes place within the 100 meter isobath or the 20 nautical miles. Um, and the offshore fishery takes place from there on. So there's a clear distinction between the two. So to the history, um, Jeremy already mentioned um, this man, J.D.F. Gilchrist. This picture is older, I think, than Mustache is a bit bigger. <laughs> um, so at the time, South Africa was going through an industrial boom. Um, diamonds had been discovered, gold had been discovered, and they were starting to mine those um, in high quantities. But there was also a series of armed conflicts, so the Boer Wars, um, happened around then, 1894. <laughs> um, anyway, the upshot of that was that um, there was a large influx of people into the country, um, workers but also soldiers, and the government realized that agriculture and, um, and agricultural um, product, um, production will not cover the rising demand. So they um, looked to the troll fisheries of both North America and England and North Sea that were producing large quantities of fish rather cheaply um, at the time. So the result were two historical surveys um, beginning in 1898 to 1904. And that was using the Peter Four, which Jeremy, where are you? It was a purpose-built trawler for research, not second-hand. Um, and then after um, the World War and the recession, um, they started again in 1922 and um, went to 1948. So we know we knew that these surveys had taken place, um, but the actual information had been lost in the archives until 2009 when they were recovered, um, digitized, updated, and corrected. So these are some of the original tables. Um, apparently some of them were also handwritten. So, um, yeah, what can I tell you about it? So here we have a list of specimens, um, these patrol dates, the number um, that they caught, 
number that they actually kept and preserved. Um, and then again, they summarized by locality. Um, I think these are only fish that they kept. So they were interested, of course, in fish that would um, bring a high economic value. Um, yeah. And then here they also um, reference their troll tracks. So everything is geo-referenced. Um, and then these um, ship's logs, some of them actually make quite um, interesting reading. For example, here they turned into Mossel Bay on June 24th, 1898. Um, and they got in, sold by auction at 10 a.m. Souls realized five pounds, four shillings, 11 dimes. Other fish, one pound, 14 shillings, four dimes. So the data that I used, um, so, sorry, the, the recent data that I used um, was from um, three sources. The first one was the um, Africana surveys from 1985 to 2010. Um, these are the fisheries management surveys. Then the offshore um, observer program, which ran from 2003 to 2006, um, which is fisheries dependent data. And then I included um, a small, small mesh survey um, done by Wallace um, in 1980. But I excluded that from further analysis because it consistently formed an outlier in the multivariate environment. So I'm not going to talk about that or include that in today's um, discussion. So after compiling all those um, five data sets, <laughs> I ended up with um, 8,100 um, troll points. Um, that was a troll only. The early surveys actually used more than one type of deer. Um, in total, it was about 314 species. Again, in the historical surveys, it was a bit exploratory nature. And so they included sponges and crabs and vertebrates. So anyone interested in that stuff, um, please. And they spanned uh, 110 years in total, and geographically ranged from Balthus by to Maputo. Um, as I said, everything was spatially referenced, which was why we could actually do this analysis. Um, some challenges were um, taxonomic lumping within the surveys, uh, primarily in the first historical survey and the observer database but also changes in the management regimes. So um, from 1933 onwards, the surveys took on um, more of a management nature uh, rather than the exploratory nature that they've been running on since then, or um, until then. And the option of that was that bycatch species were discarded. So I could actually only use data in the historical um, section up until 1933. Why do this analysis in the first place? Um, I think we've touched on this more than once during um, the symposium so far. Contemporary fisheries management has only really been around since the 1980s, um, a bit earlier maybe, depending on which fishery you're looking at. Um, and that's basically when we started noticing that stocks actually can collapse. But this means that most stocks are not managed at their historical baseline values, um, or rather population levels, um, which is really where we want to manage fisheries, especially with the advent of the ecosystem approach, um, yeah, which is um, gaining popularity. So this study forms the first real quantitative analysis of long-term trends in the South Africa troll fishery, and of course um, we hope to get baseline values for at least some of the species. A similar study has been done for the lime fishery, um, but the lime fishery is spatially disjunct from the troll fishery, so this is only applicable to the troll fishery. <laughs> so I took my 8,100 um, trolls and I threw it onto a uh, map of South Africa, and then I superimposed a 5x5 five five minute troll grid on top of that. And that allowed me to only select those grid blocks with a representative sample from each survey so that I had well, something actually to compare with. Um, 
I conducted analysis at three taxonomic levels to account for the lumping. Um, so I did it at order, family, and then species level. And I also looked at um, trawl, also looked at trawl velocity um, as a proxy for ship's power, because the um, theory was is that the older ships trawled at slower speeds, and so in order to account for any biasing for slow swimming species or fast swimming species um, between the databases, um, we needed to check whether it was actually the case um, that the that the contemporary ships were trolling at faster speeds. And then my analysis I divided into a multivariate environment which looked at the total catch composition, um, which is calculated at a, at a catch rate, and a univariate, which was the actual swept area densities. So these are the three study areas I ended up with. Um, I ended up with comparable troll grids um, on the Cape and Panta ground, the Mossel Bay here, and Port Elizabeth. The Mossel Bay ground was the best represented with 11 grid blocks, <coughs> and the um, Algoa Bay ground was the least well with only two grid blocks. And that also had implications then for later analysis. <laughs> Okay, so a brief look at troll velocity. Um, for, okay, I had two, I was able to do two um, troll velocity calculations. So the one was um, a nominal reading, which was just a velocity reading of the ship's instruments. And that was available for the second historical survey and for the observing database. And then I was also able to calculate um, an empirical value, which was using start coordinates, end coordinates, and um, the troll time. And those, that I was able to do for the first survey, and again for the observer database. Uh, now the um, Afrikaner, the, sorry, yeah, the Afrikaner trolls um, did not record, <clears throat> I believe it was end coordinates. Um, and they standardized their troll time to 30 minutes. So they have um, basically a single um, troll velocity that they map, which is about 3.5 knots. Um, so hence, this wasn't excluded from this analysis. What I basically want to say um, <laughs> is that even though you're reading the speed A of the ship's instruments, um, even in the um, observer database, what you're actually doing is trolling at this speed here, which is comparable. So all that increased ship's power allows us to do is troll bigger nets, and has acted, it doesn't have any effect on troll velocity. Um, this is the first specific analysis I found to actually look at troll velocity between two divergent periods. So I can imagine that um, it, opens up, it opens up a lot of possibilities of um, looking at other historical troll data. Just to look at the um, catch composition at um, CPUE. Um, right. So chondrichthians only enter the um, cumulative abundance at around 70%. So uh, they only form a small proportion of the bycatch. However, um, the trends are quite clear. We have decreases in um, the electric rays, the spiny dogfish, um, the nung fish, and the skates. And um, the St. Joseph shark is the only uh, chondrichthian to have shown an increase um, in the catch composition. So, yeah, yeah, in the catch composition. Uh, so this is at species level, and um, these trends were um, consistent over, both, all, over all three taxonomic levels. Okay, just a brief look at um, possible habitat changes. Um, 
We used a mixed model Promanova, which allowed us to um, look at the interaction between different factors. So we had um, trawl ground period, and then we took each individual trawl grid as a sorry, we took trawl grid as a factor um, to again discern um, changes on the micro scale. And basically, yeah. <laughs> um, when we look at troll grid, the changes in the small scale habitat over time, um, we see it's significant. So that indicates that, um, the, that the small scale changes are greater than the large scale changes over time. The swept area densities, this is probably what most people are interested in. Um, this, is, this is the baseline values. Um, I concentrate only on the chondrichthians, and I chose the six most common because data was limiting. So I'll start, um, yeah, with torpedo. Not super common, sorry, this is on the um, Cape Infantic Ground. Not super common in the um, historical, uh, the, the historical surveys, um, but a significant decline. This is in Mossel Bay, um, more dominant on the Mossel Bay ground, um, but again, a significant decline. And then the opposite for coloring is Capensis, again, the Cape Infanta ground, um, actually zero catches, and really quite abundant in the recent surveys. And then again, um, same thing here zero catches and an increase in the contemporary surveys. Uh, now, I know this looks like um, kind of a gear selector or... Anyway, <laughs> this is an actual zero catch. I know it looks like a gear selectivity problem. Um, but coloring expense was caught in other stations which I didn't include in this analysis due to having no representative sample. So um, A, the gear could capture them, and B, they were correctly identified. So this means that this is actually a, a low presence um, in the area analyzed. So just to summarize, um, there were overall decreases, uh, overall significant decreases in um, the genus Carcharionis, the Dasiatids, um, the skates, the spiny dogfish, and the torpedoes, um, which includes the, um, both the electric rays and the mountain fish. And coloring expenses is the only one to increase significantly. So in conclusion, um, there have been some significant changes in the catch composition, um, at, least for, um, at least relevant to the teleos. This has been from large, slow growth species to smaller species. The changes on the micro scale um, are more significant than uh, the large scale, sorry, the long term changes on the large scale. Um, but these trends, trends generally tie in with what we've seen in other long term studies um, internationally. And based on life history projections, um, they're just about right. So um, we've got the trends now. Now I guess the question is what to do. So Pasco, who wrote the FAO manual on bycatch and discards, um, says that there's two ways. Basically, number one, you use technical measures to lower the capture rate, so before the bycatch enters the cog end of the net. Or two, you reduce the discards, um, which usually um, is based on administrative, financial, and economic measures. So for the inshore troll fishery, Probably a change in net behavior, maybe lifting the net off the bottom um, and including bycatch excluder devices or separated panels would be best. Uh, there is still further research to do. 48% of the species I had in my um, database would be listed by the IUCN as data deficient. And as far as I can tell, that's just basically gaps in the biology. But on top of that, I can only say that these trends hold true on the troll grounds. 
um, specifically in the areas analyzed. So perhaps um, it would be worthwhile to look outside the troll grounds, um, maybe where the lion fishermen operate, um, maybe look at um, deeper water or shallower water if there are refuges there where these trends may not be true. But I think <sighs> troll fisheries are different because they're non-selective and the inshore troll fishery is no exception. We know that it's generally compliant. We know that there will never be an optimal, optimal mesh size that accounts for all species equally. Um, we know that the changes happen within a few years in the ecosystem. Um, and on top of it, evenness and, evenness and dominance have changed, but um, actual diversity is remarkably resist, resilient to trolling pressure. And we've seen that we haven't actually lost any species. So um, maybe we can have a bit more of a discussion rather than a question and answer session um, about whether we really need to do anything. Um, if the fishery is well managed and we have lost any species, is it worth implementing measures that might change the fishery into a direction that we can't even begin to comprehend? And now my throat is dry. <laughs>